I'm Isabel Allen, Editor of Architecture Today. Thank you so much for joining us for this very special webinar produced in partnership with the Kharkiv School of Architecture. It's a small, progressive, independent school which was founded with a very clear mission, which we'll be hearing more about from the school's co-founder, Oleg Drozdov. It also has a very clear vision about its role, not just in supporting staff and students through the war, but in providing an education that will be invaluable when it comes to rebuilding Ukraine in the longer term. They've had to leave their home in Kharkiv and have relocated to Lviv, which is right over at the other side of the country, close to the Polish border. They do have a building, but they're essentially having to rebuild an entire architecture school from scratch. The school desperately needs funds to purchase pretty much everything from paper clips to computers, utility bills, tuition fees, pots, pans, mattresses. We shouldn't forget that they're having to provide accommodation as well as education. We'll be hearing more about the challenges they face from the school's Deputy Vice Chancellor, Irena Matsevko, later on. At the moment, everything they need is available in Ukraine, but the school doesn't have the funds to buy them. We have launched a fundraising campaign, and if you do feel able to give anything at all, please do make a donation at the Kharkiv School of Architecture Appeal at JustGiving.com. We've also made it the lead story on Architecture Today's website, so if you visit architecturetoday.co.uk, we've made it very easy for you to click through to the Just Giving page. The fundraising's already got off to a flying start, so huge thanks to everybody who's already made a donation. There will be a Q&A at the end of the webinar, so please do post any questions you might have. You can type your question in the box underneath the live stream at any point during the webinar. Our final speaker is Robert Mull, who's an academic and architect with a long-standing relationship with the Kharkiv School. Robert's going to give an overview of the school's position within the global architectural community and outline the various ways in which practices can offer their support. But first of all, I'm delighted to be able to introduce Eleonora Lushchik, who's a student at the Kharkiv School of Architecture and is going to give us a very personal perspective on what it's like to study at the school and how this has been impacted by the war. Eleonora. I'm going to talk about the life of our institute from the inside, about the learning process, the school climate, and how it reacts to changes from the outside. My path to architecture was not quite simple. I wanted to make spaces since I was a child, but instead I studied psychology, tried to go into graphic design and communication. But last year I decided I should at least try to get closer to the unattainable. I had experience studying abroad, so I thought that it was better to start the new journey with something familiar, at least with my native language. And my friend, who is an architect, uh, told me about the Kharkiv School of Architecture, which offers a unique attitude towards architectural education in Ukraine. I didn't have a portfolio close to architectural at all, but I had a whole year to fix it. And uh, I did two things. I went to the zero year of Kharkiv School, which is uh, preparatory and also applied for an internship uh, at a research bureau. I didn't know anything about spatial research, uh, but with the patience of my colleagues and assertiveness, I managed to complete two large research projects with the team. I was actually absorbed uh, by interest in the work, and uh, in summer it was time to act to prove uh, why am I choosing a uh, Kharkiv school and why they should choose me. Briefly, uh, we matched. On my admission interview, I remember saying that architecture is about vision, but after the war, I will also say that architecture is about mission. The turbulence and horror of war complicate the need to clearly define our future and ourselves in this world, but it is still one of the main tasks uh, for now. I know that architecture is work under constant constraints of spatial, financial, time and human resources, and that's what drives each of us right now. When choosing Kharkiv School, I chose the community and certain safety because I knew it was a space where it would be safe to create as your physical work, as well as your thought and idea. 
And so it happened, my group consists of people who are completely different. But that's exactly what makes it so great and understanding because we can spend an hour discussing one issue and during this hour to learn more effectively in all areas. Our disputes, disputes right now are growing to the softest soft skills. For example, the culmination of the first semester was a group project that was somewhat experimental. We have shown a coordinated performance, but behind it are dozens of tests, disputes and collaborations. Within discussion, a human was constructed. There are four blocks of our education process, a pseudo technical and humanitarian blocks and skills. And all of them combined together helped us to come up with a result we haven't imagined. This is how I visualized our uh, educational program, which is very tight and it is based on practice and constant exchange. They are all interconnected. We start with essential and manual projects to move to larger complex structures. In the fall, we will design a theater and construct a bridge. And I really hope that everything will go according to a plan. From a small form, we will move to, onto the analysis of the whole area um, and the creation of a number of solutions based on this analysis. From the very beginning, we were taught to make a solid research for every project. We don't have lectures. We come to the Institute for lively discussion and practice. And uh, this is why each of us chose this school. At the moment, we are having partly group project and uh, the main theme of second semester is neighborhood. Uh, one neighborhood should match all the interests of future clients using different scenarios, which all apply to one context. Picturesque place in Kharkiv region. We went on the area of construction and made a research out of which each of us has created his or her own concept. Right now we're studying in different cities. Someone is abroad, but we're always thinking our projects due to values which are occurring now and after the war. The feeling of home and comfort and safety, we are the ones who will create the senses with controversies left aside. Kharkiv School of Architecture is a living organism that needs living interaction. All processes are extremely subtle. I see the future of uh, the school in Ukraine. I think that every member of our institution as well. I see experience exchange with our international friend institutions. I see collaborations and constant growth. All possible and impossible attempts are undertaken so that we can work safely in the new conditions of the war and after it for a new stage in Ukraine's history, which will be based on freedom and honesty in everything, especially architecture. The world has finally seen how much we value our own, strive to grow it and never enroach on others. Thank you. So if you're able to donate funds to help Eleonora and her fellow students to carry on with their studies, please visit the Kharkiv School of Architecture Appeal, which you can easily access from our website, architecturetoday.co.uk. And now we're going to hear from Oleg Drozdov, a practicing architect and co-founder of the Kharkiv School of Architecture. Oleg, over to you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation to, to be here and introduce Kharkiv School of Architecture, which was founded five years ago in Kharkiv, Ukraine, in uh, amazing city of Kharkiv. Kharkiv City's unfinished project has an unfinished project. Kharkiv is a city of utopia. Kharkiv is a city of archipelago, of campuses, and yeah, and then so many so many things here uh, happen it already, and I hope will be happen it in the next uh, future. And, uh, and, 
and um, unfortunately, in a very painful moment uh, in Kharkiv right now, because during fifth weeks, uh, it's it's uh, it's city bombed every day. And 100 years ago, uh, it started a um, new project, um, capital of Soviet Ukrainian Republic. This was like a moment uh, then architecture in this uh, territory uh, was a most a global high level. And this was a place where held a lot of com international competition, most famous. It's, mass performing theater that participated Walter Gropius and many, many others, future leaders of modernistic movement uh, from Japan, Croatia, and, and many, many countries. Kharkiv Place were realized uh, linear city project, Kharkiv um, tractor factory, and, and this heritage, it's still in our list of uh, researchers and uh, we uh, we will uh, this is a keep this relation with our heritage uh, for a long long time but if we're talking about this last uh, period uh, of, of uh, Soviet Union be before it uh, collapsed this is was like uh, some moment than uh, previous um, generation already stop his practice and new uh, generation uh, um, my generation was just a start this is, was like a time of long time of depression what's why this uh, um, scale of this gap was, was uh, so big and this is, means was no no interaction nor no 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 success ex exchange of tools, knowledges, and, um, and this is like a, it, it, this is break to face us with uh, uh, some self uh, finding uh, um, values, methodologies, uh, tools to develop our careers. We started for. Um, a uh, way of to to, to uh, erasing uh, inner uh, and uh, outdoor uh, spaces. Uh, we're looking for a new relation between geology and the city. We're looking for secondhand uh, architecture for uh, a special experience, and we more and more understood. Uh, necessity uh, to find a new way of relation with uh, society and with, with communities. And during the period that uh, happened um, Ukrainian revolution 2014, we start more seriously to, to think about establishing new new architectural school because in, in the air was like, a, feeling of new values, new perspectives, and um, our country becoming a, a startup. Uh, and uh, we also launched our startup, Harkiv School of Architecture, which have to bring a, a new new leaders to uh, which ready to, to change our cities. During that time, uh, our project uh, a new theater in, in historical center of Kyiv provoked for enormous public discussion. We also have to understand this is wishes and fair and, uh, and uh, um, understand this Ukrainian uh, professional social environment. Yeah, this, uh, if we look at uh, the salary of Ukrainian architects, uh, six, seven years ago, during the time when we prepared to, um, uh, our project and, and a number of inhabitants per one uh, architect with a license, we, we understood how, how important to, to train a new generation of architects. And this is, it's happened. 
so Oleg, you've given a very clear insight into the status of architecture within Ukraine at the time the school was founded. In essence, what we've seen from those two graphs is that compared to the population as a whole, there weren't that many architects and they were undervalued and poorly paid. So can you tell us a bit about how you and the school set about the challenge of communicating the value of architecture and raising the quality of architectural discourse in Ukraine over the last few years? Our main goal was to maybe create, create new community around the school during, during our uh, public uh, activities as a, as a um, public program uh, for discussion, lecturing, and this is, was some kind of uh, our maybe big phase of our, our first phase of our project. And we decide that the main qualities of architects for Ukraine in that period have to be a possibility and tools for moderating, for negotiation, for interaction between architect and other stakeholders, society and professionalists to integrate all these uh, knowledges, tools, tools and uh, and quite a deep understanding of, of future challenges, what we need uh, in our profession, because we haven't some kind of relation between our identity, our, our, uh, our industrial uh, building industries, um, about experience, and we try to introduce pragmatic uh, goals uh, for all through art, through experience, and through critical thinking and experimentation. We understood that uh, it's a deep materiality could help us to find a way to, to economy and a more short way to find a relation between um, economy and society and maybe also provide new, new creative um, possibilities to find a local solution for uh, innovation in architecture. Uh, and yeah, and I could say our, this is a circle of our academical circle already first, already done, and, and it's like a several diplomas and we, we we feel how this uh, like a social agenda very um, much rooted in, in understanding of a pro profession of our graduates. And we try to, uh, to uh, jump from, from detailing and technical craftsmanship to the visionary thinking of, of city at whole or, and region and understanding architecture, big, big uh, built environment, nature as a, as a one, as a one um, whole thing. And, but uh, during uh, circumstances of, of uh, dramatic circumstances of, of last day, we transform to uh, mostly for, from, from our professional identity to national identity and we, face to a very uh, dramatic uh, situation and in this picture al already our school which um, uh, which went uh, or relocated to from Kharkiv to Lviv uh, our, our tutors and students work on uh, on new new shelter uh, for displaced people. And also it's very dramatic circumstances of uh, uh, happening with our project. It's one of the project rethinking of um, urban design of 60s in, in, in a district, a micro region, one of the first micro, micro region uh, district in Kharkiv, transformed to uh, there's a co-living for um, for senior people, and now you see that happen it with this area, and this is exactly that building have to transform at this moment. Another a moment, what we did, uh, it's in in east um, 
East uh, Ukrainian city Severodonetsk, uh, uh, and now this uh, it's also placed of of battle and drama and now this is means uh, this strategy uh, give us a new understanding of our role and we have to transform all our um, academic agenda to this new reality because uh, uh, for us will be important to train it to improve some kind of very specific knowledges which could help future U Ukrainian architects to work with such kind of specific um, specific uh, um, matters some emerging a uh, type of uh, housing uh, as a displacement uh, and uh, reconstruction of uh, historical heritage um, buildings and environment after bombing and fire. Looking forward for, I don't know, some, some, some power and motivation that we will have uh, for this very um, very, very special kind of uh, professional activities, what we need to think uh, right now. So the overarching message there is that it's essential to keep architectural talent within Ukraine and to find the resources and the energy and the vision to rebuild and put right some of the damage that has been done. It's a mission that's resonated with architects around the world, and we were surprised, but also delighted, that our fundraising campaign received extraordinarily generous donations from a group of leading US architects who formed themselves into an organization called Los Angeles Architects for Ukraine. We're now going to hear from Irena Matsevko. Irena is the school's deputy vice chancellor and is going to give an update on the way the school has reacted to the war and the help that's needed now. Irena. First of all, I would like to thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much for um, the opportunity to talk to the uh, global architecture community. So we are incredibly thankful for the all international community for your um, uh, support. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, your calls, your mails, your messages uh, really helped us uh, to survive in this uh, uh, difficult uh, time. So in my presentation, I would like to focus on some uh, practical issues and some challenges uh, our school uh, faced in this current situation and in the state of the, uh, of the war. Um, so very briefly about the, the numbers that the Russian invasions of Ukraine uh, has violently, um, violently disrupted uh, our, our life. There is uh, no exact data uh, now, but uh, um, it's um, for the beginning of April, it's about uh, 7,000 uh, buildings are demolished and over four million Ukrainians uh, fled the Ukraine. Uh, along the population, the uh, educational sphere were impacted uh, very much by the, by the war. Uh, our Ministry of Education just full of uh, all these damages uh, and update uh, the number every day. And for the time being, uh, it's about uh, um, uh, 800 buildings which are uh, damaged and uh, 80 uh, buildings which are destroyed. Here you can see the image of um, Karazin National University in Kharkiv. Uh, its um, campuses are almost uh, destroyed and actually this uh, picture uh, just to rebuild the scale of uh, uh, devastation in Kharkiv and also reveal the scale of uh, devastation of uh, uh, educational uh, infrastructure in in Kharkiv. In Har Kharkiv is one of the biggest educational center in in Ukraine, and uh, uh, there is um, more than fifty. Um, educational um, facilities and institutions uh, there, almost all of them uh, are destroyed. Uh, 
Um, so the institutions work in different way. Some of them uh, evacuate their staff and their um, faculties, uh, and some of them decided just to review, resume um, the uh, learning uh, online. So the Kharkiv School of Architecture, so this is our, um, our premises, our, our building in, uh, in Kharkiv. Uh, so we are a private institution, small, small institu institute, and we have more freedom uh, to, to shape our policy and our rules uh, uh, in comparison with state universities. But in this very hard uh, situation, we almost um, don't have any um, support from, uh, from the state. Uh, so a few words uh, about school before the war. So the uh, Kharkiv is uh, 30 kilometers uh, uh, located, is located 30 kilometers uh, to the Russian border. So, and uh, of course, a few, a few weeks before, before the war, it was very intensive time. And uh, we decided uh, uh, to prepare to this, uh, just in case to gain knowledge and uh, uh, skills how to, how to behave in if something happened so and we had uh, we organized meetings with uh, representatives of military staff of uh, medical staff sociologists just to talk uh, how to behave in extraordinary situation but in a few days before before the war we decided to switch uh, um, our learning uh, online and let our students go home and to be with their family so, and when war started, uh, our students were with their family and we were not responsible for their evacuation. Well, most of them are not from, from Kharkiv. So the first uh, two weeks was very hard for all of us because we all uh, tried to find a new place to settle and also to come down and to, um, to cope with a new, new reality. And this uh, two first uh, week, uh, we got um, our institute and generally Ukrainian academic institutions got a lot of support from international academic milieus. So we got a lot of offers to, to come abroad to foreign universities, uh, uh, to get uh, fellowship, uh, scholarship, scholarship, even uh, a position at the university. Uh, so and uh, um, and following this, uh, and um, there is uh, no exact data how many students and faculties uh, use this opportunity and uh, uh, went abroad, but a lot. And just observing this uh, situation, this uh, brain drying, uh, at the beginning of the third week, uh, uh, we together with uh, all faculties and uh, staff at administration, we made a, de a decision that uh, we will stay in Ukraine, that it's uh, our responsibility to work here and uh, it's our responsibility in this hard time to think about uh, in long-term perspective and what we can do in this situation. We can uh, uh, give our students uh, new updated uh, knowledge and, and skills, how to deal with our city after the war, how to rethink the post-war cities and Ukraine. So, and for us, it's very important to stay in Ukraine and also to bring together all intellectual forces in Ukraine to think about our, our future uh, even now. So we decided to, to, uh, to relocate our school to Lviv. Lviv is a city near the Polish border in the western part of, uh, of Ukraine. It's quite safe uh, safe here and uh, of course we face a few challenges with uh, with this the first as and the most important thing that we uh, think about uh, safety for our staff and our and our students uh, for the time being there are um, 18 uh, students who are uh, in in ukraine and uh, 11 students who are abroad um, 10 students already came here because they are very registered that we decided to, to resume uh, our education. And we, are, uh, we hope that uh, other our students and our staff join us uh, uh, during the next months or, um, or two months and we will uh, 
uh, resume uh, uh, our um, classes, uh, classes offline. So their safety is very important for us and that is why uh, we should develop our new po policy and strategy how to behave in extraordinary situation. Um, and what is also very important to, uh, to us to be together in such very tough uh, uh, situation. We are a very small school and uh, the atmosphere in school is very friendly. Um, and uh, we have very horizontal um, relation between students and teachers. And actually this, uh, the student-centered uh, approach to learning uh, uh, bring young people to, to our school and convince uh, their parents to choose our school um, uh, for, for, for their children. Uh, so, and this approach uh, really um, uh, make us different and uh, uh, some kind special on the scale of Ukrainian architecture, architecture school. So and in this situation, it's very important to us uh, to help each other physically to be together and uh, uh, to to experience this uh, this new reality uh, uh, together mm, we also uh, uh, keep our contacts even with uh, um, our staff and students who are not with us now and here i put the picture uh, which our first year students draw every day. They know their classes for their um, schoolmates who are in the army now, who defends us now, because we have two students who went to army and two tutors who went, who went to, to army. So this uh, a very emotional connection in school is, is, very, is very important. Uh, another big challenge for us is... Uh, um, relocation and uh, settlement in in new um, in new reality we are very happy and very grateful for our uh, partner institutions institution uh, uh, live academy of art who host us uh, so it's this is the state uh, university and uh, in it's it's also lack of premises for our stu uh, for, for their students but they were so uh, um, thoughts of kind to share their premises with us and gave us uh, their conference conference room. So we will reshape these uh, um, premises for our uh, studios, uh, separate studios for every uh, for every year, and also to reshape it partly in a modeling uh, modeling workshop. It will be quite challenging for us because in Kharkiv we had really uh, very great equipped uh, premises and adjusted to um, architecture, architecture school. We had two workshops uh, and in Lviv we can open the modeling workshop just partly and we will also look for cooperation with different uh, um, uh, building companies uh, um, and, and firms who can uh, offer us their premises and their equipments to run uh, classes. We will also look for cooperation with a uh, uh, wooden uh, workshop as we can't bring our wooden workshop to Lviv. Uh, so we will look for uh, such premises in, in Lviv to have other classes, uh, classes there. It's also very, very challenging for us to adjust the program for new reality as um, uh, some of our tutors uh, are not avail available uh, uh, now. As I told that some of them are in army, two of them are in army, and some of some of them uh, um, don't have good access to internet, or some of them are in really very, very, very bad emotional condition because these people who who are originally from Donbass and who who lost their 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 homes already twice. So, and we have some gaps uh, in our program and now we already cooperate and talk with our friends uh, and uh, partner um, institution and architecture school in Europe who um, kindly offered uh, their knowledge, their skills, and uh, we will work together with them to fill the gaps in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, our, um, in our program. Uh, but the biggest our challenge uh, now is uh, uh, our financial uh, issue. So the school, as I told it, we are a private school and our funds consist of uh, 
student situations and also uh, uh, with uh, uh, donors who uh, offered uh, scholar sco scholarship for our students. We already know that uh, parents, uh, our students' parents will not have possibility to pay all sum for, for the next uh, semester and uh, we lost our donors because all of them now mm, they are working on on the army. They support uh, our army and they will do it uh, in the next period. Uh, so and we understand that uh, for us it will be a very hard period and we already uh, rethink our um, a financial strategy and uh, we understand that we should rely on foreign funds. We already look for grants and for funds who can support our institution, institutionally uh, support us. And we would be really very grateful if uh, you could uh, help us um, or suggest us uh, some funds or some initiatives could, uh, which uh, could help uh, us in this, uh, uh, in this uh, hard situation. Um, so, um, despite all of these uh, difficulties, we, uh, we will not give up and uh, we already think about the uh, future of our school. We believe that we will come back to, um, to Kharkiv. Uh, we will uh, launch, uh, um, uh, we will announce the admission this year in Lviv with the thought that uh, we will finish uh, uh, our teaching for this uh, first year students already in Kharkiv in a few, in a few years. Um, as Oleg told in his presentation, we already think and work on the restructuring of a um, program um, uh, to adjust it to new um, challenges which our country face and we feel our responsibility um, um, to, to give uh, our students new knowledge and new skills uh, to deal with uh, um, uh, post for post war crisis and post war uh, post war uh, city. Um, Mm, and we are very happy that we have also cooperation with different uh, foreign institutions and European architecture schools uh, support us intellectually and I hope that uh, uh, they will join us and uh, um, that our program will, will have a big benefit from, uh, from this. Uh, um, so the, uh, there is a lot of work uh, to do. Uh, for Ukraine after the war and education sphere is uh, extremely important here. And uh, that is why uh, we are here, we stay in uh, um, Ukraine, we continue our work, uh, we continue to teach our students, we feel our responsibility for the future uh, of uh, our country and uh, uh, our students and also for Ukrainian architecture and uh, um, recovered city after uh, after the, the war and uh, we will be happy to any cooperation uh, with you. So thank you very much. So do remember we will be having a Q&A session at the end of the webinar so if you have any questions for Irena or any of our other speakers please post them in the box at the bottom of your screen. We will be answering as many questions as possible after our final presentation. So now we're going to hear from our final speaker, the architect and academic Robert Marl. Robert's going to explain how the Kharkiv School of Architecture sits within the context of the global architectural community and why it's so important for the profession to pull together now. Robert. Thank you, Eleonora, Irena and Oleg. I was honoured to be present for a short time in the very early days of the Kharkiv School and to witness the clarity that shaped it and the extraordinary ambition to create a school that articulated a new architectural culture in the wake of the 2014 revolution. Since then, I've watched the school gain local and international impact well beyond its physical size. So when the war started, I feared, I was distressed that the school would close and all of this would be lost. I was then able to speak to Oleg and Elena and was inspired to find that the school had relocated to Lviv 
and that students and faculty were regrouping, re-establishing the school and working on live projects to provide temporary housing for the displaced. They also shared their vision to make the school a centre for thinking about how Ukraine would be rebuilt and how Ukrainian cities would be a sustainable model for how all cities should be in the future. As they put it, it's an opportunity to correct the mistakes of the past. Their clarity and ambition was wonderful. And it was clear that in a very real way, the school and its future is important to us all. Within a wider context, the school is part of a network of small, independent and free thinking architecture schools and educational networks that are playing a key role in reinventing architectural and urban education and in reforming planning and urban governance. These schools that are deeply rooted in the culture of a particular place have global impact in that they are part of an international architectural culture that defies borders, allows for the free passage of ideas and operates with clear ethical purpose. From Latin America, Africa to other parts of the former Soviet Union, these schools are often born out of political change, scarce resources, climate change, the effects of displacement, conflict, and the need for reconciliation. As such, they lead the way in finding strategies for addressing the global challenges that unfortunately will affect all of us within the next 50 years. The Harkiv School is a leading school within this context. Their decision to stay in Ukraine and to nurture the expertise and talent necessary to rebuild Ukraine is characteristically brave. But as Oleg said, the alternative is a diaspora of talent and skills and the colonization and dissipation of Ukrainian architectural culture in the name of reconstruction. This in many ways is unthinkable. So please, it's time to help in the ways Irena has described. This help will need to be sustained and continuous and include the need to provide funding now to re-establish the physical and academic infrastructure of the school in its temporary home Lviv, the need to provide financial support to students and faculty who would not otherwise be able to study or teach, the need to support the work the school is doing to construct temporary housing for the displaced in Lviv and elsewhere, the need to assist in recasting the school's curriculum and courses to meet the challenge of rebuilding, the need to share best practice and provide expert input from practice and academia, and of course, to support the school to return to its home in Kharkiv. But it has to be said, and to a certain extent, it's a challenge to us all, that the architectural community has a poor record in responding to such crises. For example, my area of practice and research is displacement and the architecture of the refugee crisis and the architectural and design community has largely failed to respond in a coherent or effective way to this challenge. There were very few architects in Lesbos in 2015, in Calais in 2016, or now in Turkey, working with refugees. That the Kharkiv school under the most difficult circumstances is building for refugees in Lviv is amazing, and perhaps a wake up call to us all, and surely a prompt for us to act. So now it's our chance to, as Oleg and Irena said, correct the mistakes of the past and get it right. As has been said, this has started. There is a just giving page on Architecture Today's website and many people and organizations have already been extraordinarily generous. Discussions are underway with the Architecture Foundation, Design Museum and others to stage further events in support of the Kharkiv School. But there is so much more that can be done. So if you have new ideas or want to talk anything through, do feel free to contact me at r.mull at brighton.ac.uk and I will help and communicate with the Haki School and support you. Thank you in anticipation. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, now, we've had all sorts of questions coming in. Um, I'm going to kick off with a question for Oleg, which is about Norman Foster. 
Um, so Oleg, a reader's written, a viewer's written to say, I see that Norman Foster is spearheading a campaign to rebuild Kharkiv with architects, planners, and economists around the world. Can or will the school be involved? Yeah, in one hand, uh, it, it shows that uh, a good mood of our mayor and our government who invited Norman Foster and uh, another one, this attention to Ukraine, especially to, to, to the Kharkiv, it, it's, it's very important from um, side of big names. But we also have to be aware about uh, uh, then we during the war after colonization uh, we we could uh, yeah, go to other intellectual colonization and and, and we see that uh, super important um, for us to to build uh, um, um, not only civic society and also new new policy governments involved uh, as, as, as much as a possible uh, participants in the process of rebuilding of the country. And I could say we are on platform uh, of Kharkiv School of Architecture already um, uh, founded a coalition of experts and, and academic institutions which could uh, form values and agenda for rebuilding Ukraine. And this is, will be also part of our academic agenda and also we are acted to all our uh, um, schedule or to this um, current uh, and future uh, challenges. Thank you for that, Oleg. Um, Irena, I know this is an issue very mm -hmm. dear to your heart, isn't it? And obviously, <laughs> Ukraine's particularly vulnerable at the moment. Um, architectural culture is very vulnerable. Um, do you want to expand a little bit on your views on the importance of any rebuilding effort really being led by Ukraine rather than outsiders? Yeah, so actually, thank you very much for, for this uh, question uh, about big names and, uh, and known uh, architects, because it's, uh, there is a, the a most important question behind this question. Who and why uh, should be involved in the discussion and in the process of reconstruction? Um, and this is very important, especially for Ukraine, uh, the country which uh, is uh, still in the process of, uh, in the period of transformation, a country which is uh, still uh, learning how to discuss, for how to come to com common, common dis decision, how to info involve different um, actors and especially in this situation it's very important to, to be uh, more open and to involve as much as possible uh, um, local actors of the process and the first of all it's uh, local community um, also experts also artists so different different actors uh, who live here who know the situation and who actually have voices. Of course, uh, um, we should uh, bring experts abroad uh, uh, for this discussion as well. Uh, but it's very important to, um, to locate uh, um, global experience and knowledge uh, in the local context. It's very important. It doesn't work just to make copy paste. Uh, so and in this situation, uh, and I um, I hope this, that uh, in invitation such a big name will provoke this discu uh, discussion. Who uh, uh, should be involved in this discussion and also in the process of um, rethinking post-war uh, cities in U in Ukraine uh, from abroad? And uh, I believe that. Uh, it should be if we talk if we talk about architects. I believe that it should be architects 
and experts who already have experience working in Ukraine. It's very important to understand uh, all local context, political situation, uh, cultural background. So, and there are a lot of such architects who already have experience working uh, working in Ukraine. And uh, another, it's also experts who already. Uh, deal with uh, post-war uh, architecture study and post-war reconstruction. And in this case, it's very important to link them with local experts, you know, not to make, again, just uh, repeat, not make copy-paste, but also to, uh, to think how to imply the best, the best experience in local context. So, and um, actually, um, uh, we should discuss it on the um, local local level, who and why should be um, involved. But, you know, but the first uh, 21st century is, is the century of, of stars and uh, for sure um, our authority will invite a lot of um, big names, not only in architecture, but also on the other sphere. And uh, um, people also like it, uh, this attention to the country. So we can't avoid it. But as an uh, experts, we should be very clear with our um, statements and uh, uh, to open this discussion. Because it's uh, from this discussion and from the people uh, and experts who will involved in this um, um, process, uh, uh, so the um, um, it influenced on the results uh, of uh, rethinking and rebuilding um, Ukrainian cities after the war. So I think that's absolutely highlighted the, the kind of scale of the challenge, which is obviously this is an opportunity for the global architectural community to pool its um, incredible resources and expertise, but to do so in a way that is coherent, coordinated, and actually appropriate and respectful to Ukraine. Um, obviously not going to crack that now, but we're going to come back to that subject. And I've had questions coming in from all sorts of people who are very, very keen to help and don't quite know why. And we are going to um, go back to Robert and let him talk about that in a minute. But first of all, I just want to talk to Eleonora. Um, Eleonora, thank you very much for giving that very very engaging informative account of what it's actually like to study at Kharkiv. I was struck and I'm sure most people were by the irony of the fact that you selected it specifically because you wanted a safe space to study and to explore architecture and its potential. Um, so I wanted to ask given that you're in Lviv which of course has been bombed in the last few days we we're all horrified to see does it still feel safe? Has the school managed to carry on providing what feels like a safe space for you to learn? Um, thank you very much for these questions. Um, safety at schools still remain in the most in the most possible way. Of course, right now there is no safe place uh, on the territory of uh, Ukraine. And uh, each region is daily under the threat uh, of shelling, but our work must continue. Um, I see how everything is arranged uh, in the learning process. So strict instructions are assembled in different emergency situations that give us a sense of understanding of our actions. And of course, the best uh, stress relief uh, is a routine work everyday learning and return to the activities we are good at. And on the subject of, of education and nurturing the students, Oleg, we've had a question coming in about what you think are the most important skills for the new generation of architects going forward. So Oleg, what are you prioritizing now in the syllabus? Yeah, I, I could say this integration of um, different interests, uh, different um, knowledges, uh, different uh, urban uh, layers, it will be very important uh, because our, our, our architects in the future in decade will be faced for quite a complex um, 
uh, task, and this is it means that era uh, does to have enough multidisciplinary skills inside one one of professional body, and also to understand that is super important this process of negotiation. And I could say, and our general line to uh, be. Um, uh, moderator and integrator, uh, this is, will be most valuable skills for uh, next decade in Ukraine, because uh, this all, all our um, policies will be in the in uh, in, in mm -hmm. process of development. And this is, means we have enough sensitivity, which could be a uh, serve or, 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 or um, or de uh, developed uh, in terms of our uh, new uh, uh, values or, or on this uh, to solve values. Tough on importance of to disciplinary working and collaboration. We've had a very specific question about whether we've reached out to the whole construction industry to help. Um, Speaking for architecture today, I'd say, well, we've tried. <laughs> Clearly, we have quite a specific constituency and um, it does span the disciplines, but mostly it's architects. If anybody watching has other networks, please share this webinar and please share the link. Um, of course, we want to reach as many people as we can. We've also had people asking about how related disciplines, engineers, surveyors, conservationists, um, can help and who they need to talk to. So um, I'm going to go back to Robert, who's very generously offered to coordinate um, a lot of these offers of help. So Robert, I've got two questions really for you. I'm getting queries from academics who want to offer support in terms of teaching. Um, so maybe you can explain what might be needed there and whether there's any scope to make the most of their offers, um, but also other professionals who want to know how they can help. So can you, or can you also, you might regret this, but can you also please give your email address again? We've had a specific comment and I'm very grateful that you've agreed to um, help field some of these queries. I'll do that at the end, if I may. Um, just a couple of things really. Um, I mean, it has to be emphasized again that the immediate need is for practical and financial support, uh, and that is critical. And that, as I understand it, um, Irene and Oleg, is really around establishing and consolidating the temporary home in Lviv. Um, it's also around continuing the school's capacity to carry out live projects in the way in which it's already started. But also, of course, to be in a position to return to Kharkiv and re-establish the school in its home. Um, I suppose the other thing I would emphasize that really has been talked about in the various presentations and, and the answers to questions is, is the school's school positioning itself to play correctly the sort of leading role in the reconstruction of Kharkiv and Ukraine generally. And that is a very sort of delicate process whereby the school is inviting um, input in particular areas, very particular areas that there might be a need for sustainability, etc. But to do it on the school's terms, really, as guests of the school, and to do that in a way that is really directed by the school and directed by the needs as they evolve over the next period. So I think it's a, it's a whole range of really important um, needs, starting, I think, with what's so wonderful about this event is, is really practical support. I think in terms of academia, there's been a number of supports and, and relationships with academic institutions across the world. And initially, as I understand it, that was around filling gaps in the curriculum because members of the faculty are not available to teach. But going forward, I think it is really about beginning to help with establishing the courses and curriculum necessary to um, make certain that the school is in a very, very strong position to play that role going forward in terms of reconstruction. Now, we're going to go and have a look at the Just Giving page, and um, I wanted to read out some of the incredible comments that have come through. So, 
if we look down quickly, I'm going to read out a random selection, but it's an incredible outpouring really of support. So we've got the heroism and vision of your efforts and keeping a progressive school of architecture going is important and inspiring. Strength to all the students and tutors at the Kharkiv School of Architecture. To inspire the next generation of Ukrainians, we're with you. You people are amazing. Please keep the spirit flowing. What a brilliant crusade. Every best wish for its success. Um, Ukraine needs, a crucial one here, Ukraine needs to keep training its own creative architects. We support all your efforts to make this a reality for young Ukrainians. Um, so absolutely heartwarming. Can we uh, see how much we've actually raised? It's just gone over £38,000, which is... Just for context, we originally set £25,000 as the target and um, I thought we might be being a bit over ambitious. And uh, thanks to all of you, but actually especially to the Los Angeles, our Los Angeles comrades who've been incredibly generous. Um, we hit that target a couple of days ago. So we're now trying to raise £50,000, which would be absolutely fantastic. Um, and I might actually go back to Irena just to give us a sense of what that £50,000 would allow you to do in the immediate term. Irena. Yeah, yeah. So for, first of all, thank you very much for such great support. It, it's it's really important for us now because as I, as I told that, uh, it's, it, it's hard to... Uh, look for um, support in Ukraine now because all our um, businesses or initiatives who, who support educational sphere, they all now work for uh, for Ukrainian army and and this is important their input there. And so and we extremely um, grateful for your initiatives and for uh, for such support. Uh, so f first of all, mm, what is the most urgent for us uh, is uh, mm, institutional support. So we we are very happy, really, that our team is with us. So the mm, the the war ruined uh, um, institutions relations, and we survived in this situation. Almost all our team are with us. Uh, our tutors are with us, and it's very important to to support to support them. And to continue our educational pro, um, process, so the part of this uh, uh, money will go for salary and other institutional support. Uh, it's also very important uh, for us to make uh, to make uh, um, workshop places. Uh, um, uh, convenient and comfortable because uh, it's essential for our school, especially for first first year and the second year who who work uh, uh, in workshop constantly. Uh, so and uh, and this money will also go for um, arranging some st some stuff and and generally for for new premises. We uh, we are happy that we are, uh, we are hosted by Academy of uh, of Art, but we should arrange this premises. So all all this uh, um, fund uh, uh, will be used for um arrange, arranging um our work in in live uh, and for support uh, our tutors and our staff and we hope that uh, we will be successful with uh, um new uh, admission this year so and it will help us uh, move faster so this this support for this very hard period uh, of the first uh, um, months of the war till the beginning of the new semester in in september is really crucial for us thank you very much and i've got um another question for oleg uh, Oleg, this question has come in from Chris Williamson, who's a very uh, preeminent architect and I'm very grateful to Chris because he actually kicked off. He was the first person to donate to this campaign. Um, and he says, how much assistance have you had from the RIBA and do you have links with any other UK schools? So Oleg, have the, has the RIBA been in touch? Yeah, yeah, not not uh, yet. Uh, we much connected with RIBA, but uh, it's uh, but before war we selected um, um, a set of books. Uh, public RIBA published it, maybe asking about I don't know some kind of our library. 
but in, in terms of uh, our situation, I think we want to start this collaboration because um, we think that a transformation um, after war of Ukraine will be needs uh, a deep consultancy for changing urban policy and, and procedure and methodologies and th this is that's why we maybe need some kind of um, help expertise help from RAB but also uh, we in several direction of redevelopment of the country we we need to be um, to be cooperate with and if if we t touching our relation with institution just a week ago we negotiate start of cooperation with uh, Nottingham school also we have a straight uh, consultancy and help from um, Robert in cooperation with Robert Moll who represented um, a school of architecture in Brighton and also in part of our team Warren Bart who uh, who uh, works in in department of uh, AA uh, urbanism and housing and urbanism uh, of uh, AA school and yeah we 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 think that uh, and 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 think that uh, UK becoming a quite a, a big uh, player in in uh, in in um, Side of uh, Ukraine during last two months, uh, and uh, and I think we also uh, believe that in academical part and and recovery of Ukraine, uh, UK still will be one of the most important partner. That's why for us this kind of relation uh, it's it's very welcoming and very very need need very much. Okay, and um, Eleonora, I'm going to put one last question to you. It's a, a very kind of broad question that's come in, but it says, do you envisage any major changes in the form of Ukrainian cities when the opportunity comes to rebuild after the war? And um, the question says, away from high-rise Soviet-era apartments. Um, that's very specific. I think you can ignore that. But I am interested to know, have... Are you allowing yourselves to kind of envisage a future rebuilding program? And if so, what does it look like? Um, hmm. um, of, of course, um, each of us uh, understands the future mission uh, that uh, that will need to be uh, that will need to to be done. And um, we, as uh, future architects, are having um, some perspectives about that, the development of uh, the ruined cities. And uh, right now, our program is uh, redeveloping towards uh, the new uh, circumstances. And uh, we are um, already discussing it on the examples um, um, on the examples from the history. Of course, they are not uh, quite the same. And um, our situation is completely new um, and has never been seen in the world's history. But still, uh, we are trying to understand uh, our future steps uh, by, um, by um, working um, and trying to to think in multidisciplinary um, um, studies because we understand that um, the future cities will need um, a really uh, strong uh, bonds and corporations. And so um, now um, our task uh, is uh, to not, not to hurry with the um, with the decisions and with the pictures of uh, the future cities, but but to learn, to observe um, what what uh, what the results uh, we're gonna have uh, 
what will be left from the cities, um, what, uh, who, um, who will want to rebuild the cities. Um, and um, by processing all that, we are um, not making any visualizations um, of the Kharkiv or of Mariupol or Ipin or Bucha. Um, we are thinking that the time will come and right now uh, we just need to uh, concentrate on our our skills and uh, on uh, cooperations so that in the future we will uh, build a really strong um, multi multi vector i don't know uh, if if there is such world uh, word environment which uh, will be uh, rapidly developing um, not only um, on the stage of Ukraine, but on the stage of the whole world. Thank you. That's very clear and very inspirational. Um, so I just want to reiterate a few things before we leave. There's all sorts of questions about people saying how do we offer financial and scholarship support. Um, just to be clear, the, the Just Giving campaign is going towards scholarships. It costs uh, the school around $4,000 a year per student. Um, they're not getting any support from the state because they're an independent school. Um, that campaign will run for another couple of weeks. We'll continue to have information on the AT website about how you can help. If you have other queries that are about teaching support or professional support, please do contact Robert and to give his email address again, it's r.mull at brighton.ac.uk. Um, he will try and help the best he can. Um, it is a slow process. We know that people are, are, are desperate to help and please don't be frustrated if we can't immediately channel that enthusiasm. Please do keep at it. Um, in the meantime, thank you very much for listening and for all your incredibly generous donations and huge thanks to Eleonora, Oleg, Irena and Robert we wish you all the best, of course, and we'll be in touch over the days and weeks ahead, uh, maybe months and years. Hopefully the oh, terrible situation will start to resolve itself. And next time we all come together, we'll be much more focused on rebuilding and recovery rather than the immediate challenges of survival. Um, I'm going to end there and just remind you all that you will be receiving a recording of this please share it, please share the Just Giving link with anyone you can. And if we haven't asked your question, send your email address and we will try and get back to you. Thank you.